in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Lizzie Haynes, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights to the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Russell Guest, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host from right here in the steel city of Pittsburgh, Mr. Chad Robinson. How are you doing, sir? It's still spooky season. It's the best time of the year. I am... I'm excited to talk spooky movies. Depending on when this drops, we will be about at our six-year anniversary for launching the show. And so it's a big moment for Retro Movie Roundtable, so we brought on one of our best guests for his seventh time, lucky number seven, Mr. DJ Bryant, also here in the Pittsburgh. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How about y'all? I'm great. This is, I'm, it's like Chad said, we got Chad in a good mood for Halloween. We got you here. So this is going to be fun. What candy are you going to be passing out at Halloween this year? Are there any tricks or is it all treats at your house? DJ. There will be some pole tricks and the candy will be peanut butter and covered in chocolate. My favorite. Okay. Okay. And Chad, how about you? Your house is decked out for Halloween. The the yes. listeners should know. I mean, and there's no visuals here, but he's taken it to like another level. He has like a like a wet ghost girl in the top window that fades in and out, like position next to the window. I mean, there's m- multiple pumpkins. Like we're not talking about like six, like lots of pumpkins. So tell us what are the what are you passing out at your house and other tricks to go with those treats? Yeah, we're the full-size candy house. I have to entice the children. Like you said, I've got a demonic clown projection in my upper bedroom that just, it fades in and out and she does a bunch of nasty things and it's just intimidating. There's clowns in the yard. There's like 30 some pumpkins. I I did buy a, a ghost swing this year. So that's new that uh, it has this little girl's voice that calls them to the graveyard to come play with her for eternity, which is a bit dark. Mm -hmm. And the kids across the street are four, so I don't know how that's going to go. But yeah, full-size candy if they show up. That's right. There you go, right there. So my house, uh, we're passing out probably Sour Patch Kids and Mm. um, probably Swedish Fish. Like These packs tend to come together. These are things that I like. And uh, some Reese's Cups and some things like that will be in the mix as well because just I like to give people options. Um, if you come late at night, I have like one of those giant emergency grab bags that I always have to resort to of cheaper candy that I don't really intend to hold on to. But you know what? This neighborhood is hot for like trick-or-treating. I get a lot of people trick-or-treating in this neighborhood. So, And the trick is, it's not really a trick, it's just a, it's a delightful treat. If it's a repeat of last year, my son, who was three last year, didn't want to go trick-or-treating. He wanted to pass out the candy and see all the costumes, and he danced and sang and was adorable and handed everybody their their sucker or their whatever it was, and he would say, whatever, whatever the costume they had on, he'd be like, here you go, Spider-Man. Happy Halloween. And like... You know, and he'd look at me like, who's that? I'd be like, that's Pikachu. He's like, here you go, Pikachu. Happy Halloween. So nice. that was what you would get at our house. So now what's the last movie you saw, DJ? Oh, the last movie I saw was probably. It could just be in your living room. It was in the theaters and I can't remember. Oh, it was the. Um... Oh, Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson. Yes. It's a Asteroid City. It's really oh. good. Yeah. Really beautifully shot. I did enjoy Asteroid City. I am not a Wes Anderson guy, but that one, it, it just hit the right notes for me. Wow, this is, I'm, this podcast is already, that. there will not be a surprise greater than <laughs> that for the whole night. Chad liking a Wes Anderson movie and seeing it promptly after its release, this is, this is impressive. So, um, Chad, what was the last movie you saw? Was it Asteroid City? It was not. So. Okay. So my daughter, she just came to me last night and she said, I want to watch a movie. Like, all right, what are we watching? I was expecting the greatest hits. Cars 3 is is her go-to. And she goes, I want to watch The Princess Bride. I'm like, all right, 
going to be a great night. She's never seen The Princess Bride, just out of nowhere. She loved it. I love it. We have the favorite scene of Vicini and the battle of wits to the death. That was what she said was her favorite scene. That's my favorite scene. She loves Fezzik. It was great. So just magical time. You got to cover that one earlier this year, Chad, and I am jealous I was not there with you on that one. That's a great movie. So I was not giving that up. I wish I could have joined you, but anyway. But uh, my last movie that I saw was just probably a little bit before recording this was Grant wanted to see A Bug's Life. So oh. we saw A Bug's Life. And you know what? It's better than I remember. Like, I don't know why I haven't seen it in a long time. And I was like, if you had told me to rank all my Disney movies, I don't think I would have had that one very high. In fact, I think I might have even just forgot about it and put it in my bottom quarter, but it's better than that. So I don't know exactly where I'd rank it, but it's it's a good time. It hit that weird time frame where you had the B movie and you had ants, and I think it just got confused. B movie is not good. No. No, Jerry Seinfeld, what are you doing? Well, his voice is great for animation, but the movie's weird yeah. and bad. Speaking of movies that some people find to be weird and bad, but I like and it's, <laughs> it's good. Chad, what movie are we going to be covering today? We are covering a Tales from the Crypt Presents movie, Bordello of Blood from 1996. That's right. This stars Dennis Miller, Erica Elaniak, Angie Everhart, Chris Sarandon, and Corey Feldman. Its release is in 1996. It's made... For a modest budget of $2.5 million, it grosses $5.7 million domestically. It places it 141st in the box office. That's not real high, but again, not a whole lot of money was put into it either. So it comes in behind Last Dance and ahead of Get on the Bus. So those, those are classics. Right. The number one movie that year is Independence Day. Check out our episode 167 on that one. IMDb, not kind to Bordello of Blood. It gives it a 5.4. But if you didn't think that was kind, the critics of Rotten Tomatoes said 15%. And the audience score is 31%. So, DJ, had you seen this movie? What was your background with it? I had seen this movie. So, growing up, I was a big Tales from the Crypt fan, the TV show. And so, when they started putting out a movie, I definitely saw this. I don't remember how or where I saw this. It definitely was not in the theater. It might have been a blockbuster rental, but that was my context for coming into this movie, just being a Tales from the Crypt kind of junkie, basically. Okay, so you you were a fan of the TV show to get you into it. 100%, yeah. Okay. It went right there with, like, Are You Afraid of the Dark, Tales from the Crypt. Like, these all were my kind of shows growing up. Did it work for you at the time? It did, actually, and we'll talk about why it did later. Okay, all right. As you're coming back to it today, as a more mature, older DJ, do you still enjoy this movie? I do. I do, actually. My husband actually refused to watch it with me um, because <laughs> I showed him the trailer and he's like, I'm, I'm not going to. No, absolutely not. Ouch. Um, I know. Burn. But I think it is a, still a good movie and a, a cult classic in many ways. Interesting. No, you're, and you're not alone. There are other people who enjoy this movie. So, Chad. You are apologist for B-movies everywhere of the horror genre and C-movies and even D-movies and your catalog <laughs> of horror movies you've seen is, that, is just fathomably deep. Where are you on Bordello Blood? Had you seen it before in your giant catalog of horror movies? I had. So I have the same experience as DJ here. Start with Are You Afraid of the Dark? Kind of graduate to Tales from the Crypt. I was a big fan of the show growing up. I saw Demon Knight when it came out. I revisited that somewhat recently. That one still really holds up well. I didn't even know Jada Pinkett Smith at the time, but that, that was a big one. And so this one came out as well. And I saw that, uh, I don't know, some sometime early college or so. And it's an interesting one. It's, it's definitely a cult hit. And it it has some very, very fun scenes that we will, I, I'm sure we'll talk about, but it's been probably the most interesting movie we've studied this year. And you wouldn't think so for a two and a half million dollar Tales from the Crypt movie. That's not what you expect. So I, I'm excited to talk about this one. I am too. And I had a different, I had a different experience. I did not know the show. At all, I didn't. I didn't Ooh. know about the existence of Tales of the Crypt, and I did watch some of Are You Afraid of the Dark, and I did enjoy it. But I'll be honest with you, it challenged me at that age. I'm the same age as you, Chad, but I was just, I was, I was slower to horror, and things that scared me scared me. So like, I, I don't know, like, 
I mean, even trying X Files and stuff like that at like seventh grade, I was like, this is kind of scary. So I got this in junior high, undoubtedly. So if this came, if this comes out in '96, I'm probably getting it on Comedy Central Ooh. at around '98 or so. So I got the TV version. I'm not gonna lie, I tuned in and my attention was grabbed very quickly. Uh, by what all that was going on and it was a strange combination between like this is funny i liked it like i was already a saturday night live nuts so you had me at like dennis miller but then i also it had baywatch's eric eloniak on it it had angie everhart and like i as a teenage boy i was immediately like 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 my my attention was like sucked in it's like and the very premise of some brothel or whatever being held at, in secret at a funeral home, funeral parlor facility, was a str- was these are strange feelings. For, so um, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. It's a steamy movie, and that I remember sitting there during a cable, like being like ready to change the channel in case my parents happened to like come by because it was like I was like, wow, you can do more on TV than I thought. This is this is um. This is in, this is a, I don't know. There's no other way. This is a hot movie. So I saw the TV version, which is toned down considerably <laughs> from the real version. So I think Chad even warned me I, before we got into it. He said, uh, I don't know what you I don't, I don't even remember how you phrased it. It's like, it's, it's intense. There's a lot more of it. And I was like, really? And um, he's right. It was. So I have always kind of enjoyed this movie. I find it funny. I don't necessarily find it to be a, like a wild horror movie, but it's a comedy movie, and I love my comedies, and it's a fun time. And they, they maintain the funness well enough. Anything that it is slammed on for its negative features, I think, are held under the guise of, I'm having a lot of fun here, and it's working for me. So I will be an apologist for this movie all evening long. So for those who haven't seen this movie, though, I don't think you want to spoil it for you. I mean, uh, Right Chat is a very complicated movie. I feel like you spoiled it in that one sentence of... <laughs> Hot people in a brothel disguised as a funeral parlor. Yeah, like, that's that's all you need to know. Yeah. Maybe vampires, vampires, or... vampire hot ladies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, yeah. All right. Well, we just spoiled it for you, and I'm sorry, but I'll give you my normal <laughs> spiel anyway. We will be back after these messages. Welcome to the All Eighties Movies Podcast. I'm Bill, and I'm Jason, and this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, we've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe, and happy listening. All right, we're back, and this is your final warning. There will be spoilers that lie ahead. Now, Chad, for those who haven't seen, Tales of the Crypt presents Bordello of Blood since 1996. Do you want to refresh people's memories? Catherine's brother, Caleb, goes missing one night, and she turns to private detective Rafe Gutman. Rafe follows leads that eventually lead him to a mortuary that's moonlighting as a brothel. Turns out the brothel was actually inhabited by seductive vampires. Rafe drops his wallet as he's fleeing the brothel, and the vampire mother, Lilith, tracks him down. Turns out, in another twist, that the brothel itself is a scam run by Reverend CJ to punish sinners and get rich. He loses control of Lilith, and she kidnaps Catherine. Rafe rushes to the rescue, and a final confrontation takes place in CJ's church, where Lilith is burned with a laser cross, and Catherine stabs her heart with a candle stand. After they're safe, Rafe checks Catherine for bite marks on her neck, and, not finding any, proceeds to get a little frisky with her, until he discovers two puncture marks on her thigh. Catherine flashes her fangs and chows down on Rafe. Why don't we hop right into it now? You you mentioned, DJ, that you would say on the other side of the spoiler wall, one of the things that drew you to this movie, and obviously you helped us select it. Go ahead and indulge us now. I mean, it was 100% Angie Everhart as Lilith, because as, well, okay, so context here, 
as a closeted gay man growing up to see a woman kind of in power like that and owning her sexuality and like being a head woman in charge, basically HBC to kids these days. I was drawn to that. Like I thought that was amazing. And just the way she talks was very seductive. And I, and to be not a trained actor, it was very knowing this now that was very impressive back then. She really carried the movie really carry the character as well as like, like I said, like I was a complete kind of subscriber to tales of the crypt, the TV show. So that was my gateway drug for this. And then to kind of have this movie to kind of experience it with was just even, even better. I'm going to ask both of you, cause I don't know. Is this in keeping with the experience you get from the TV show? Yeah, I think it's perfectly in line. It's the show is always a little cheesy, a little punny, a little kitschy. Like, can't be so it's not necessarily like bigger per se in terms of its budget or presentation necessarily it's just like a 90 minute version of a tales of the crypt episode per se like oh you're both nodding your heads at me like quickly so so tales of the crypt i take it the crypt keeper was this was this key figure like who would just like basically introduce you to the yeah yeah so the setup was always the same so the crypt keeper would always do kind of the cold open basically Mm -hmm. you would kind of enter like they would always be like some sort of like skit or scene with him doing something he would introduce the show and then kind of disappear until the end where he reappears and then kind of does his outro yep and each one's completely unconnected and you know, it's not like Are You Terry to the Dark where there are some characters who come back. Like, everything's completely... Contained kind of thing. There's, it's not, yeah. Okay. There's no seriality to it. Interesting. Knowing that, does this necessarily... Is this the peak of the Tales of the Crypt experience? Like, would you say, like, this is the pinnacle? Or is it... No, there's episodes that just really hold out to me. I think the absolute pinnacle is Demon Knight. Demon Knight as the movie is... It is critically upheld, and as a horror fan, it is fantastic. If you haven't seen it, please go see Demon Knight. It is it is wonderful. There are some individual episodes of Tales from the Crypt that I won't get into, but I kind of hold near and dear. But it, this is still a fun ride. Like If you plop this down and condensed it into 45, 60 minutes, it would fit. It, it would fit, and it would be memorable t- as well. Okay. What about you, DJ? Yeah, so I think, like Chad was saying, like I, there are definitely episodes that hold that nostalgia pull for me that will always be more powerful because of that, seeing them when I, I was that age in my life. But to see this like as, again, a 90-minute episode is like even better. And then furthermore, to see it kind of syndicated, I don't know if that's the right term for this, but to, to be put out there as much as it was versus the actual TV series at fact mm-hmm. was even more powerful. I feel Yeah, we only got three seasons of tales from the crypt, I think. And Corey Feldman was in the TV show apparently. Yes. So he's a returning face, different character from what I'm understanding. So yeah, you see actors reused in tales from the crypt. Like they, they had their people. Got it. And Gil Adler or Gilbert Adler, the director and AL Katz, the producer are from the TV family. So this movie is being made by people, or at least at the top of the bill anyway, or like the people with the creative minds of it, are people who oversee the TV show, which probably, to some degree, like you guys are saying, feels like what you got in terms of the experience of the TV show. I think that's good. I mean, I can speak to other TV series whenever you watch a movie that's a TV version of it. All I expect is maybe a higher budget and higher level production. And I want... I. I'm a fan of the TV show, so I want that. So based on what you're telling me, that sounds like a success. I'm curious to know why this is... We'll get into it here. Like This movie, if you YouTube it, there is a series of videos that basically say how not to make this movie. There's a podcast by A.L. Katz saying how not to make this movie. It's intense. It's multiple episodes. It's, it's, it's running multiple years. It's a very interesting podcast. It's, here, it's interesting to hear the stories about making a movie behind the scenes. It is widely held to be an embarrassment. Perhaps that 15% critics score is what they're so embarrassed about. But this movie made some money based on the box office here. and It's considered to be an utter failure. 
I want to talk about why you feel like that is, DJ. Like, why do you... Obviously, the critics didn't connect with it. But so often they don't, particularly with comedies. I mean, why isn't this something they would be proud of? I mean, that's a good question because, again, seeing it in retrospect and recognizing its kind of cult quality now, much like Rocky Horror, that was a pretty much a failure in its time, but went on to become this thing. I think that even though... The people who were connected to it experienced so much turmoil and trauma because of the production of it, mm-hmm. yet fans still like it for whatever reason, whether it be their subscription to Tales from the Crypt, whether it be their identification with the actors involved, whether it be just the plot of kind of vampires, right? Like there's a whole TV series now, True Blood, that is just about vampires and it's campy it's kind of cheesy at times. Like, it works. For whatever reason, it works. Yeah. I think maybe what you're saying is true, because this was a very troubled production and with its process. And I, I undoubtedly that'll keep coming back up throughout tonight. When you hear the Ale Cats and Gil Adler talk about it, they have an enormous amount of regrets over their casting. They felt like they were taken from a movie that they wanted to make. Chad, do you want to talk about how this movie... Normally, we don't talk about this at this point, but just go ahead and talk about how this movie came to be. Yeah, this is a tough one because it's almost studio spite. So uh, the the two leads in this, the the directors, are trying to produce a movie that they are super excited about. It was going to be called Dead Easy. And they are so excited about this movie, and they're pitching it for years as this passion project, and they're given a green light. And so they're going in with a script. And just there's pure excitement. And at the last minute, it gets pulled out from under them. And then they're told, hey, instead of doing Demon Knight, because they passed up on on Demon Knight, you're going to do this student-written film called Bordello of Blood. And they're like, ah, but we want to do Dead Easy. We want to do this psychological thriller. We don't want to do campy vampires. And then the studio messed with their location and move them to Vancouver. This is supposed to be set in the American South. New Orleans specifically. like Yeah. Then the studio messed with their casting department. Their casting director had worked with them for years. They didn't get to cast their three leads. The studio said, we want Dennis Miller. If you listen to How Not to Make a Movie, the podcast, they literally say they've never gotten a reason for Dennis Miller. They have no idea. Angie Everhart was forced on them. She's gorgeous. But they called up Billy Friedkin, who'd worked with her on Jaded, and said, hey, Billy, would Angie be able to carry a movie in this type of role? And Billy Friedkin's response was, no, she's she's limited to very specific things. So this was way out of her comfort zone. And then Erica Oleniak, she gets a script for whatever reason that is marked Hamlet. And so she signs up <laughs> for Hamlet, and then she's she's reading the actual script and saying, "I'm not doing this." She was signed up as like an ex porn star with a ridiculous name. I can't remember what it was, it was. originally. Chesty O'Toole, Chesty O'Toole, <laughs> and then yes. they changed it, and then they changed it to Chubby O'Toole, like she was yes. like like yes. A, like a, like a heavy hitter. So everyone involved was somehow out of their comfort zone, except Dennis Miller, who just, he's open, been open about this. He's like, it was a million dollar payday. Go back to Russell's point. This is a two and a half million dollar movie. One million dollars went to Dennis Miller so that it ate into their production time. It ate into a lot of things. So this is, this is a disaster. And on top of that, we've got like Angie's dating Sylvester Stallone. He famously cheated on her. Fun story, like he's cheating on her with someone in his trailer, but left his mic on. So everyone in the crew came on. He's apparently a very instructive lover. And so everyone in the production crew the next day had special t-shirts made with the instructions he was giving this oh lady. My. And so I got back to Angie. So she's she's upset on set. Yeah, there's so much working against this movie and they're just hamstrung at every point you can't cast who you want as your leads you can't film where you want you can't even shoot the movie where you want so that explains a lot of the i would say apologetic tone of the creators but dj this cast i feel 
isn't actually bad. You've already said nice things about Angie Everhart, but I mean, I read mean things about like how Dennis Miller behaves, but I don't think his performance actually sucks by the time it's edited and out there. I, do you like the cast doesn't feel like it is a disaster piece to me, does it to you? I mean, I would agree with that because like, like, like you said, like we know the backstory of Dennis Miller and what, what we are told it's like to work with him, but he comes across as punchy and funny and the jokes land. Um, and then we got Corey Feldman. Like, how how can you not like Corey Feldman? He is like one of the most likable actors out there, I feel. And he's good at whatever he does. He's really good with voices and impersonations, too, um, which is really funny. Um, Erica Alonik, I mean, my impression of her is like she definitely plays her role very well. And, and it kind of works with where she's at in her career, wanting to be taken as a more serious actor coming mm-hmm. up with Baywatch. And I mean, you can tell like there, she has no nude scenes. There are certain things that she's not going to do. I feel like, you know, there, the amount of breasts in this movie is insane. Like, and the fact that they, that they did not include her backstory as the chubby O'Toole, yet we get an allusion to it at one point. is pretty hilarious as well. I agree. I, I think, the pieces seemingly fit too well. And if you if I hadn't dove taken this deep dive, I never for once would have said, Oh, this movie's got bad acting, bad cast or whatever. I mean, if you critic if the critics just said this is not what I'm in for, then that's fine. I mean, blasting vampires with holy water with squirt guns is not your thing, then Mr. Ebert. But I mean, it it works for me. The bikers didn't come off as bad actors. Like the the Asian guy in the bar, I don't know what he was going for but I think he went full simple Jack and it's just very, very strange. The other biker with the warning I'm more okay with. It's like the slobbering moron that we encounter a couple of times where he's just, uh, they'll do things without a name. Like he's, he's just being that weirdo. That's fine. But some of the other people, what character are you going for here? The extras are probably where the bad acting comes from. But for me, I I was glad to have watched some of these other podcasts and listened to them because it explains some things. Some of the characters aren't reacting to Dennis Miller, how you would think you would react to the lines. And it's because they had to reshoot it. Most of the time, Erica is not on stage with Dennis Miller. And so it's a stand in. So she was reacting to what should have been said. And then Dennis Miller is just straight up improving, And so you get these very strange lines and people are just reacting normally to it. So I wish there was better chemistry there. That part stood out to me. And whenever I heard, oh, if you pay attention, it's never, it's never really the two of them together. Then it made sense. Okay. Okay. That, that's why she's almost reacting cold to something that Dennis Miller said that's funny. I really don't feel like, unless you're told that, it shows, though. Do you, DJ? I would agree. Yeah, I I think, I mean, there are moments where you can definitely tell where there is some kind of awkwardness. But again, I feel like because of the whole premise and the setup behind this, you never question it. Uh, The suspension of disbelief is so powerful that it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm watching a a movie about vampire whores like right. this all makes sense it was interesting and i i'm not trying to go full misogynist or anything here but dj you mentioned there's a lot of nudity how in the world i i don't know if in her career angie everhart was not doing nudity at this point she certainly does later but that's an odd point and i don't want to be the typical male like yes we need the the supermodel naked in this movie but when there's a lot of naked women in this movie and you've got the chief the queen of all of them and you even get the line about her dennis miller specifically address her breasts how in the world did she escape that yeah like you know angie as well as erica both of them you never see them fully exposed um and i think that I mean you are right about the the misogyny in hollywood and the the perception of, you know, the minute I feel like at that time, at least a woman exposes herself, it's practically porn. And that's not, that's not cinema then it's, it's just pornography. And 
obviously that is not true, but there is a stigma around it. And even to this day, like, you know, if, if a woman shows her breasts on Instagram, it's going to get banned. If a man shows his torso, it's fine. It's a thirst trap, whatever. Yeah. And to your point, Chad, if that's what you're looking for, take me home tonight is your movie. Not this one, but um, there she's got a couple of them. Yeah. Okay. But I, I suspect she was being introduced to the world as an actress. I mean, you know, I think she just, like you said, she had come off of jaded. I mean, I'm not sure at this point in her career, again, when things happened for, I mean, she did sports illustrated swimsuit issue several times and stuff like that. I mean, it's just like Kate Upton made like a semi dip into the acting world at one point. I think it's very similar to that. And so when you're trying to make headways and something like that, that that all makes sense. And like you said, DJ, I think, or Chad, Eric Eloniak said, I wanted to be a serious actress at this point. Now, it blows my mind how, if that's a goal of yours, how you accept this movie. Or she thought she was doing Hamlet. If you, you, might be th- you, might th- you might think that, but as soon as it becomes evident, you're done, right? I, I don't know how she gets to continue through with it at this point. <laughs> I mean, maybe they explained it's like Hamlet, but with vampires. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's a campy comedy romp. So, I mean, it's interesting. Joel Silver was the producer that just said, I have to have Dennis Miller. I really have to have Dennis Miller in a movie. And I'll be honest with you, I think that Dennis Miller's edgy and funny. And certainly at this phase of his career, this is not the Monday Night Football Dennis Miller necessarily this is um i i think dennis miller is funny if you said if you told me i want to give dennis miller the lead part in a movie i'd be like yeah i'm just really sad when you read about it he did not treat it very well and i can't promise you it's just this movie but i mean there's one interview with Corey feldman where he said i called him up and said like hey you know i was doing stand-up comedy as a young person you were in the audience you're really really supportive of me and um, you know, you gave me some advice that really meant a lot. We're going to Vancouver. I know the town. Do you want to go out and talk? And I mean, just very enthusiastic, nice stuff. And uh, he's like, he's like, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. And it's just like, as you can imagine, Dennis Miller would be. He's like, uh, can I be honest with you? I don't think this movie's going to be very good. <laughs> and Corey's like deflating as he's listening to him, to him talk. He's like, I'm not really an actor. I'm more of a political commentary. And he's like, this isn't really what I do. And apparently his way of saying no was just to slap a high price on there that was so high of one million dollars nobody was paying dennis miller one million dollars to do anything at this point so he could have been had in theory for even less so but one million dollar price tag had to be incredibly frustrating to the director because like chad said it came out of the production sets budget yeah and so they were they were thinking it was going to be daniel baldwin not alec baldwin uh not billy baldwin right daniel baldwin and they said, I really would have rather had my $750,000 and Daniel Baldwin than because Dennis Miller was a headache for them. I mean, DJ, I don't know if you want to, I, I don't want to just totally run Dennis Miller through the mud on this one, but I mean, it, reading about it's pretty sad. I don't, I don't know if you want to share any of those things. I mean, you're absolutely right. They had a lot of, I think it was $250,000 for that role in particular. And when he clapped back with the one million figure, they had to come up with seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it came out of the budget for production of this film. And I think it's 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 sad in a way because he didn't take it seriously. Like he wasn't on set. He did all these things with these these people who really wanted to make a connection with him. Like Corey Feldman reached out and wanted to workshop with him and help him out. He also reached out to Erica Laniac, and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. The only person who actually kind of was interested in kind of hanging out with him and kind of workshopping was Angie Everhart, who was notoriously, they were told to stay away from her because she's Sylvester Stallone's girlfriend. Like, don't mess with her. And so it's it's almost like the backstory to the story is this kind of comedy of errors or, you know, this kind of these mishaps about like what not to do with actors and chemistry. And, you know, Dennis Miller didn't help it. Like, he was just too full of himself, I feel like. He exuded, I don't want to be here. I think Corey Feldman said he saw set people walk by him like he had his newspaper up in front of his face. And they'd be like, good morning, Dennis. And he just like, ah, and just not even take the newspaper down in front of his face. Or, you know, he constantly would go back to them and say, 
I'm tired today. Can you shoot me out of that scene? He's the main actor. I mean, right. shoot me out of the scene. I mean, he said from the get go, I work eight hour days. And that is preposterous in acting. Like, I mean, you don't, you're, you're paid handsomely. You're paid a million dollars. And, and yeah, you do work 12 and 14 hour days. That is unfortunately what you do, but you work very intensely. You get it done. And again, you're very handsomely rewarded for it. So, and, he did not have an aggressive makeup session. He wasn't one of the vampires that had to be made up like to the nines either. So it's just show up minimal makeup and just be here to, like you said, he's going off script so much. He throws it out the script pretty much and just said, I'm not saying that, which is probably wise. I believe Dennis Miller does pull his weight. I think much of what he said is, is funny, but the ability of the actors to be able to play off of him um, is limited when he's not the one standing there giving him that Dennis Miller cadence and that candor that he has, that sarcasm. It's like some guy reading lines in the studio probably wouldn't be able to carry that through. So if you're just literally, you know, actors act with the blue screen constantly now and they're acting with a tennis ball. But at this phase, that's not to be expected. And I do believe with comedy especially, Acting with a tennis ball is difficult. And I think that these actors were maybe not acting with as low level of a tennis ball, but it was still, it's, it's a challenge. And uh, none of these other people, as you mentioned, I think Chris Sarandon's actually a pretty good actor. And Aubrey, the, the old dude who runs the morgue, he's pretty good, by the way. But the level of acting that you have, particularly from Eric Alaniak and Angie Everhart, that's just kind of one of those. It's a big ask to fill in the blanks. And I does again, because it's campy, it doesn't show. But I think the people who made it really wanted to make something they love so much. And this was something that they were sent to make. And so looking at all these problems with it really, really bothered them. You know, DJ, you're an architect. I'm sure that whenever you have something built, you see flaws with it that typical people just don't see. And you kind of know, man, I wish I had done some things differently. I think as they talk about this, this is that because... We've covered many other movies that had trouble productions. I mean, Wizard of Oz was one of those great movies that had everything seemingly go wrong. I mean, people were getting burned. People were getting put in the hospital. I mean, we're talking about major level issues here, health and safety issues. <laughs> so as best as snowflakes, I mean, it, you know, it's uh, we have seen trouble before, but somehow when it reaches a high payoff, Exorcist is another one that comes to my mind here at Halloween time that we're in like terribly challenging production but Wizard of Oz and Exorcist are masterpieces so I think I think there's some degree of like oh it's all excused whereas everything for this is like I'm embarrassed I was involved with this or whatever and it was so hard it's a very interesting movie to dive into as Chad said it's rarely is a movie this fun to dive into behind the scenes because the amount of sheer honesty and unfiltered negativity that the people who made it seemingly have so, I mean, as you know, Corey Feldman would just say, he's like, no, I've never been on a set like this. This was a big moment for me. Like he was coming out of rehab and he's just like, what is this movie set? This is weird. I think one of the things too, is that like you mentioned about being in architecture and like seeing a mistake you make kind of erected in real life. That honestly hurts less because I can blame me for that. But and I feel like what the problem with this film was that a lot of the people feel now is that because they recognize the potential of what it could have been and the compromised nature of the decisions that were made or the circumstances they were handed, that made it a lot harder for them to be able to accept that as a reality. That's an interesting way of putting it. So, you know, I'm coming to work trying my best and then... I'm being stifled by others. That's an interesting standpoint on that. You know, yeah. you can't blame yourself, right? You, you can't accept that. It's, you know, and blaming others isn't always the best way to go, but, you know, it's out of your control. You can't control it. And they're all control freaks like we are. And let's frame this up. So our producers and directors were not expecting to put out Citizen Kane. They were involved with Tales of the Crypt. So they knew the product they wanted. It was still going to be campy. There were still going to be corny lines, corny dialogue, and there was going to be ridiculous over the top gore. Like all of that was still going to make it into their type of movie, even though they wanted a psychological thriller. I think their ultimate frustration comes in 
hey, because of Dennis Miller's salary, we didn't have time to go back and shoot longer. We didn't have time to do reshoots. So we had to plug in weird stand-ins and have Erica react to what was written that we didn't have time to really rewrite because they started, the studio heads called and said, hey, you're starting shooting now. And three weeks, they had three weeks, which was like, which was what they had to do like dead easy. Is it like what you were talking about earlier? Like they gave him no extra time. They sent him out of New Orleans up to Vancouver with not a full written script and said, here you go. <laughs> so I think that's where a lot of the frustration is, is okay. Yeah. It was always going to be campy, but we want our actors and actresses. We want to pick who we're actually going to put in this movie. And then we want them to be able to react to each other. And because Dennis Miller, he was on set for what, like four, eight days. He, he wasn't there very long. It was a, it was a very, very small amount of those three weeks that he was actually there. And he would, he would fly back to do his show and things like that. He demanded a private jet and they just said, no. He did make everybody mad because like they had a certain week set. And he said, I'm not working on those days. So everybody was planning on not working on Saturday and Sunday in Canada. This isn't, this isn't the film industry town that it is today. And he, he said, I need to work on Saturday and Sunday here so I can go back. And my weekend's going to be, now it's going to be Monday, Tuesday. Nobody's contracts on the work team was written that way. So again, the one guy who got paid $1 million and eviscerated the budget has shifted in everybody's Everybody's angry. That's the time with their family and kids and stuff like that. And so there were shifting moments in that. Like Miller wasn't popular before he started acting. I no better way of saying it than a diva. Right. It is interesting, though. DJ hit the point of Angie ever hurts the one that she's she's clearly out of her element. Like this is not her wheelhouse being the star of something. She's more able to act and control a scene. I, I do think she did a good job in this, but she's the one trying the hardest. And she's getting, we have some influence of Sylvester Stallone. And you'll hear, if you check out the creator's podcast, they have some animosity towards Stallone because he's feeding her bad advice. But when they broke up, things got better. But she is, she is trying to do her best for whatever she's in. And I, it came through for me. You can still see the limitations, but I, I'm not asking my supermodel to be Meryl Streep. I'm not asking her to win. She does, she does the best job she's able to, and it shines through of, okay, she's trying. I'm glad somebody was taking it seriously. Her and Corey Feldman, give them more screen time. <laughs> Well, Joel Silver, the producer's one who forced Angie Everhart, he was doing another movie with Stallone, and Stallone said, hey, put my fiancé at the time in this movie, and it's Hollywood. Nepotism and favors are done all the time, so Joel Silver put her in another movie of his. He had done another movie with Cindy Crawford called Fair Game that hadn't come out yet, and he thought that this was set to be huge, too. So Joel Silver's big thing was celebrity supermodels in movies. This is going to be hot. It's kind of interesting. I don't think we have, maybe I'm losing my cultural, pop culture relevance here, but DJ, we don't have the notion of the celebrity supermodel like you did with like Heidi Klum, Rebecca Romaine Stamos, Tyra Banks, Cindy Crawford, you know, like Angie Everhart, like, like that's not a thing anymore, is it? I don't feel like it is. And I'm trying, I'm racking my brain now about who the supermodel was who made a cameo in National Lampoons, Christy Brinkley. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like we we don't have many crossovers like that nowadays. I feel like At Kate Upton. I mentioned Kate Upton, but she's that's not that current. Yeah, that I can. You're, rattle, yeah, yeah. You're looking at the Kylie Jenners and the Kendall Jenners, and I don't know that you you certainly wouldn't classify them as supermodels or anything. But no, they're like reality TV personalities, right? They're attractive influencers. I think influencers. that's where it shifted to. Okay. Mm. In the influencer category, we have Billy Eichner, but again, he's not a supermodel. He's an influencer. It's an interesting piece of time and an interesting experiment that ended up falling on its face, both with this movie and that movie. Neither were box office smashes and, you know, getting people who can act. I've heard modeling people don't like dealing with movie people either. They want to, they want to work with models. So, I mean, they are very different disciplines and what they require is very different. So perhaps not totally shocking. But why male models? 
<laughs> Anybody could die in a gasoline fight. Right? Ha. DJ Robert Zemeckis wrote the first version of the script with Bob Gale. These are guys who I know you like because I know you're a Back to the Future fan. You helped cover us. Was it Death Becomes Her? Yeah. You helped us cover Death Becomes Her as well. And these are Robert Zemeckis kinds of efforts, dark comedy things. This script was initially Zemeckis was being courted by or potentially threatened to leave for Spielberg's company. And they said, what can we do to get you to stay here at Universal? He said, buy the script for me. So they bought it from him for a fair bit of money and basically giving him a nice paycheck for no reason. And he'll stay at Universal. And it, that worked. But the, somebody at Universal said, I'm not paying this much for a script and not making a movie out of it. So they did. But then the script that actually resulted isn't really that close to what Zemeckis and Gale had done. So I'm curious. I can't really tell what the major differences there are, but do you wonder what the Zemeckis, and it's early Zemeckis. This isn't like Back to the Future Zemeckis. This is student Zemeckis. What do you think that that would have probably looked like? Just, you know, the Zemeckis version in your head. That's so hard. Yeah. If I had to guess, like, so let, let's, let's dissect this. So like we can definitely see the kind of campy kind of components working in place, which I feel like, Death Becomes Her really plays up a lot. Sure. Punchy humor, like insane kind of antics and scenarios, etc. Back to the Future, in terms of his work, I feel is it is sci-fi, and it's not something that you would um, really experience normally in a cinema. But I feel like it is a bit more measured in its kind of its build and its tone. But you, he gives you these kind of these iconic characters, whether we're talking about Goldie Hawn or Meryl Streep in, in Death Becomes Her. Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit. Doc Brown. Like they are these kind of like quirky, weird kind of characters. And I feel like we see that here. You know, Lilith, she's the sexy kind of vampire, but she has her quirks to her with her kind of her her punchy, uh, seductive comebacks with people as she's murdering them. We also I mean. I don't know if we can say this for Dennis Miller's character because he wrote, rewrote most of it. But, I mean, he is hit this kind of like this comedic kind of persona kind of making fun of this. So what would this look like in the original form or had Zemuckis had more of a heavier hand? I, I honestly don't know. And I kind of want to know, actually. Yeah, me too. Bob Gale, who had co-written the original screenplay with Zemeckis, does not like this film. He said that it was the first thing that he and Zemeckis had ever collaborated on out of school, and the movie was just so different that they would consider that, I'll tell you flat out, I've never seen the final version of it, he said, because I saw a script for it, and I was so appalled to it, I wouldn't even bother with it. So it is wildly different, and I have to wonder, it doesn't have to be a Tales, it wasn't made to be Tales of the Crypt, by the way. So like, yeah. like it was just a, it was a script. I am curious, what is this seemingly unaltered, unused script out there? I'm with you, DJ. I kind of want to know, is there another movie that we could have, another Zemeckis movie? And if this is Zemeckis, and they did hand you a million dollars just to buy the script, how is it you don't say, I want, you and Bob Gale don't want to do this yourselves? That's a little bit of a confusion point I have. Like, is it just, it sounds like it was just strictly, give me some money, I've got some other things I want to work on. You know, I'm busy with Roger Rabbit. I'm busy with, you know, these other things. It could be that, it could be. But I can't help but sit there and go like, if somebody pays you all that and you wrote it, it's your content and it's somebody you like working with, why don't you want to make it yourself as part of the deal? That's what I don't understand. The whole thing was to get a Tales of the Crypt trilogy. So they put the right people in charge initially. They just took all the power away from them. Like you get Tales from the Crypt alum to direct a Tales from a Crypt movie. But this one crashes and we never get our trilogy. Because because of the failure of this movie, I will always lament that there wasn't a third Tales from the Crypt movie that came out. We just get Demon Knight in this one. But there was a third planned. It makes sense to me. Zemeckis probably would have been too expensive at this point, too. That's possible. Like, There's no way, after all his success, you've got a $2.5 million budget. It's true. This is, this, this is post-Forrest Gump, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like 
how would you like to do this for a hundred thousand dollars? No, 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 sir. That's fair. That's and fair. And how would you like to direct Dennis Miller for a hundred thousand dollars? No, hell no. Right. I just feel like if it was mine, I'd want to see it through in some way, shape, or form. I'd want to be the producer or something on it, even if I don't direct it myself. But that's just my opinion. To just hand it over there and someone slaps your title on it and. I mean, your name's pseudo attached to it in some way, shape, or form, even though it's not, it's not written on the movie. I'm not saying it's Zebecca's film, but uh, I just, I'm curious, what, what would it have been like? You know, it was considered to be made way sooner, too. So, like, you know, this could have been made way before Forrest Gump 2. So this, this, is, this, this movie sits on a shelf for a long time. I mean, it was a student project from the 70s, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. In Brian De Palma's blowout in 1981, John Travolta's character in the movie has a bordello of blood in the background, and that was an existing movie until 15 years later. But Zemeckis had inserted that, that so its existence goes back to the 80s. Yeah, we have the Anthrax song "Bordello of Blood." That's what Corey Feldman's listening to. That's fun. He says that's fun, but Russell. I can't imagine Russell's an Anthrax fan. I'm not an Anthrax fan, but I just like the referential. There's a lot of reference in here from what I'm reading. Like, you know, the, like you know, there are Tales of the Crypt little tidbits for people who did like the movie. DJ, I don't know if you can point to any of those for us, but I noticed in the trivia there's lots of that. Dennis Miller outright says, it feels like we're in a bad Tales from the Crypt episode. He what, a prescient, what a prescient line that is. There are Tales from the Crypt references. There are also X Files references because I believe it's also filming in Canada around this yeah. time. The cross that was used that contains the it controls Lilith basically is a repeat prop from another Tales from the Crypt movie. Um, so there's there's kind of some connection to this kind of cosmology of Tales from the Crypt movies and films. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Vancouver thing. That's an interesting component of this. Vancouver, is, you, if you watch movies to the end. You often see this movie was made in Vancouver a lot. Like it's a it's a booming film industry now. They got there when this was just the beginning, as you mentioned. X Files was shot there, but there weren't the robust crews there. They were just le- going up there to fight the filmmakers' union, basically. That was a power play by Joel Silver to just say you're making it in Vancouver, and they wanted it to, like Chad said, to be in the southeast, particularly New Orleans. They never outright say it's New Orleans. I will admit. I'm not feeling Vancouver in it. I am assuming the South. Aren't you, DJ? No, I don't assume anywhere because there are no Southern accents. Dennis Miller even says jag off at some point, which is yeah. strictly a Pittsburgh that's, that's a, term. That's a Pittsburgh thing. And so I, I, I can't place this other than maybe the house, the bordello itself. That yeah, it looks Southern. Kind of looks Louisiana kind of Creole, but eh, eh. Yeah, I was stunned hearing the the director go on and on about how they were making up Spanish moss and other things I'm thinking, why did it matter where this movie was set? Nope. I, it absolutely doesn't. So I, I think they were just clinging to that, but I had no concept of it being in the American South. It could have been the Hollywood Hills. It could have been the mountains of Colorado in a remote Rockies part. It could have been in the far Northeast. You're right, DJ. The story works fine in other, other places. There's no straight up voodoo in it that says this has to be New Orleans. Yeah. We don't get a voodoo priestess. Like, yeah, there's nothing that kind of connects it to New Orleans. We don't even see any food really in it. So, you know, we can't even judge it based upon the cuisine other than the raw burger that weirdo's eating in the bar. Right. No beignets. <laughs> The other bad thing about working in Vancouver is summertime in Canada, you get very long daylight hours, and this movie is a vampire movie at nighttime, and the production crew, as if they hadn't had Dennis Miller's schedule and all this working against them, <laughs> Mother Nature's working against you too, stealing you with all these daylight hours and stuff like that. So again, that's that's really working against you too. I got to give him credit. That glass church is just the Enterprise Hall from the 1986 Expo. They show that thing off a ton, and I, I loved it. I loved every minute of that. So, but yeah, to your point, like in Vancouver, I believe it gets actual dark, dark around 11 o'clock at night, and then the light starts coming back in at 2 a.m. in the morning. So you get like three hours of shooting time, mm-hmm. and again. 
This is ostensibly a horror film. Therefore, a lot of the action occurs at night. So you're kind of, you know, time boxing yourself very, like, strictly into this one window. And you have all this other drama going on with Dennis Miller and everything. And it's like, how are you going to make this movie on time? And this is not a time when you can just set up blue sheets behind your house either and just do whatever you want to do. Like, you still are constrained at this point in time working in on location unless you choose to go to a set which that's not the way you do this at this point in history either so i mean that would look cheesy and very flat and cardboardy the location interesting that you guys both said you just ha- you, you put no thought into it i somehow did get southern off of it but you're right even the guy who runs the funeral home is very british yeah one person who we didn't talk about also contributing to the issues on set a little bit was erica laniak she just went in her trailer a hundred percent of the time like when she wasn't shooting, it wasn't just giving Corey Feldman a, a cold shoulder. It was everybody. She would come out, shoot her scenes, and go in her trailer. And I guess she had had, she calls it drama, the business. I hope it's not Me Too-ish things. I hope it's not, you know, bad actors that have hurt her in some way, shape, or form to get her in this position. But she really was cloistering herself and saying like, I'm in my trailer, I'll read my lines, I'll be a professional and come out and do these things, but that's so... Can you really do that with any job, really? I mean, much less a collaborative acting one like this, so it's not just Dennis Miller not being there to bounce ideas off of. She's not there herself and present on the film, and she even herself has some regret over just where she was at her... You know, I was in a dark place at that time in my life, and that's what I did. Yeah. I did shut myself off from whether it be Feldman, you know, or Everhart or other people. And she was the one who just said, I'm, it comes off as being, I'm too big to talk to anybody. I'll be in my trailer. She was the one that they were excited to get. Like they understood why she was cast and they were excited. And yeah, the end product is she's cold, quiet. It's kind of the, uh, this is such a weird term nowadays, but it's the quiet quitting, just doing your job, the minimal to your job, and then going away. That is a strange term, I've, I, not to get off on a tangent, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, the director seemed frustrated, and again, this is 90s, but that she wasn't willing to do any kind of racy things, like she's really laced up, and that because she That's was the character, though. I mean, they, they did respond to that well, like they made this very conservative character, yeah, which they I think ch- is funny. They changed the character, but she was supposed to be recognized. Her connection to Dennis Miller was that was his favorite porn star. And he was supposed to be watching a porno of her when she came into his office. And that was how they were going to know each other. And she she wanted to be. That would be funny. Yeah. She wanted to be really buttoned up about it. And like, you're in a movie called Bordello of Blood. Can you uh, unbutton some buttons? I wish she had leaned more into the conservative prude type thing, because at one point, like she says, I shouldn't expect no worse or whatever. And she calls him a fornicator. Like, a, like it was like a put down. It's really funny. It's really like, I wish she had dug into that prudish kind of way and been more uppity and more holier than thou kind of thing. And, you know, she does make a documentary and like, just like goes right up to, you know, Angie Everhart's like, what is it that's led you to this life of like filth and, you know, disgust? Like, I think that's funny. I think you should really play with that persona a lot more than she did. And again, that would require improving and working with people. But I mean, I don't think of her as a comedy actress, in fairness. I, they wanted Robert Givens for this part. And from what I've read, while she's another beautiful woman, by the way, but she's also quite difficult to work with on set. It could have only gotten harder, possibly. So, <laughs> um. According to Erica, they actually did film a scene of her as chubby o'toole and she wore a fat suit for that but that was never included in the film itself so we'll never know as a horror movie and we keep talking about this as a comedy and all the things but as a horror movie i don't think it looks bad do you chad no no the the effects are over the top and they'll talk about the the blood doesn't look quite right or it's too thick or whatever i i add that as a bonus like This type of movie, I don't need the blood to look realistic. I don't need to have the exploding heads look realistic or when a head is winding up in the punch bowl to look realistic. It adds to the charm when it doesn't. So to me, it's a a plus when in the moments you know what type of movie you're making and you lean into that. So 
the camp for me and the effects, the low budget, that's all a plus. I agree. DJ, I mean, like the look of these things, I think is scary enough to realize that that's something to be scared of, but it's funny, which is what you, you, you don't want to actually scare anybody in this one. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Like I'm not, if you ask me what is the best shot or the best kind of cinematography, cinematography will. in this film, I can't easily point like this is really good. I'm not looking at it for that. I'm looking at it for the story, the comedy, the horror, the cult kind of following of it. Like the suspension of disbelief is there. I don't need it. It felt like a parody. We covered UHF earlier this year, which has a Raiders of the Lost Ark parody in it. This movie opens up on like what felt like a parody of Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're like reassembling the vampire heart and stuff like that. I think my expectations were set then and there. So I think Todd Masters, who was from the uh, special effects team on Tales of the Crypt, wasn't initially slated to do this. They were trying to save money. So they tried to have people in Vancouver do it. And they didn't get the right X-Files people on the team. So there weren't a lot of other people around. So they got people who did an okay job, but it was really scaring them and not looking good. And you can lose people because if it does, if it actually looks like Chad said, I don't need real blood. And I don't need real things, but it can go bad to the point where it seems like amateur hour and they were headed for that. And so Todd Masters, they ended up bringing, they, he said, I kept getting phone calls like, how do you make blood? Like really simple things. In the end, he drove up there and checked it out and they ended up bringing him in because they needed him and you know when you end up sliding a giant tongue down somebody's esophagus and bursting it out or the exploding nurse by the way i the exploding nurse is, looks great like like she like balloons up and then it like blows up i mean some of the stuff's great and there's other stuff to your point chad like when lilith transforms she's making uh, one-liners and like pithy little comebacks and stuff like that I thought it could have worked out. You could have had his brain and I could have had his body or whatever. Like, it doesn't work if you truly make a truly terrifying. We don't need the predator out here. Like, you know, like, it's okay that it's a little bit goofy. That's okay. Todd Master says, I kind of feel like I didn't find my iconic thing in this movie, but I think he nailed it personally. I mean, no, Lilith doesn't make me sit there and go, like, I can. That's what it, my picture of the movie is her transformed as the monster, but I, I don't think it was going to be that anyway. That's not that was never going to be my image of this movie. No, it's a low budget version of species. It's a campy version of species. I like species too, by the way. So Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Russell's wheelhouse is find sexy succubus. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Anything. I guess I have a <laughs> I guess you have found something that works, so I don't know. But absolutely, I think some of the effects do really make it great the holy water scene where they're like they just they're melting apart and flames are coming like out of them and it's just it's a whole lot of fun the half torso running around i think the scariest thing in the movie is the crypt keeper i would agree oh. with this i would agree with this the hand missing as he holds up his arm just casually talking to everyone yeah i told you i was a lightweight with horror movies when i first saw this so i like when comedy central like watch bordello of blood and i was like all right that's sure i'll watch this and then they, i almost turned it off i was like this crypt keeper guy i'm, I'm it's like 10 30 at night i gotta be able to sleep after this i'm i'm almost out so luckily like we got past that quickly enough so yeah it always bothers me when people gatekeep horror and like you've said, this is this is more of a comedy, and horror encompasses so many different subgenres. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to give you nightmares. It just has to have horror elements. We've got vampires. We've kind of got the succubus. We've got demon control here. So all those elements, and it can still be fun. It can be Tucker and Dale versus evil. So if you're out there saying, "Oh, this isn't horror. It's too funny," don't gatekeep, please. I mean, I think it's primarily a comedy if you wanted to pick one thing that it goes under. But I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it's made like a horror movie with it's, all the craft of one. So. It's a hyphen. It's a horror comedy. Sure. I think it was interesting. Angie Everhart also said she had fun with all these prosthetics and stuff that they were putting on her. She'd sit and make up for hours and hours and hours, which she's used to probably being a supermodel. But she thought it was she thought it was really funny, like being made up to be really ugly and scary. And it's like, oh, you privileged pretty person he's like it was fun to be ugly for an hour <laughs> right <laughs> this is how charlize theron felt during monster yes. <laughs> music it helps this movie be more fun doesn't it dj it does especially in the scene where they're you know 
squirting all the vampires with the holy water and they're being blown apart into bits. But yeah, like it it is to kind of a light of it. Like and honestly, out of all the the music pieces in in the movie, that's the one that stands out to me the most. Yeah. Ballroom Blitz is blasting in the background as they're going on mayhem here. So I'm loving that one. Chad, how about you? Any musical thoughts on this one? I like it all. I, I like Cinderella. I like the Scorpions. Thin Lizzy's fun. Ramones are fun. Even the inclusion of Anthrax of waking up half the neighborhood and he'll turn it up so the other half gets to hear it. All of these things. I tend to have a higher tolerance of 80s music uh, than Russell. Uh, there's obviously some 90s in there as well. But Ballroom Blitz, uh, DJ nailed it. Is, that's, that's what makes this movie. That is what people will come away and remember. They'll remember two things. One, Angie Everhart is ridiculously attractive. And two, Super Soaker exploding vampires. Two, yeah. Power and Blitz. Like, those will be intertwined. Well, I, I can ditto that for sure. I will say, notably, we do not get the typical Tales from the Crypt intro song to this movie. Oh. Which is pretty interesting. Nor do we get the house and the setup with a Crypt Keeper that you normally see in the TV show. Okay, so there are some divergences and changes in approach here. Did Demon Knight feel the same way when it began, Chad? I don't know how to answer that. Feel the same way as the show or feel the same way as this this movie? Yeah, like did this movie feel cohesive with that? It still feels like a Tales from the Crypt episode, but Demon Knight seemed more coherent, I guess. It, It seemed more traditional, and I don't think they wanted to do anything too wild or too different right up front because it was their first big adventure into the movie Mm -hmm. exploration yeah and this is a first time movie director tv and movies are really different so directors have an enormous amount of control and that's being handed a level of responsibility as a tv creator you would not have had before so the directors are coming more from a writing background themselves so all the challenges that they're facing would be challenging for any director i think dealing with dennis miller would be difficult for Anybody? You mentioned William Friedkin earlier, who I guess had uh, worked with them on Tales of the Crypt for an episode, actually himself at one point, and had worked with Angie Everhart. I, uh, my, my mind went to, he's a real hot-headed dude, short temper. I'm pretty sure Dennis Miller would have gotten punched had William Friedkin been, <laughs> been the director on this one. So, Well, they uh, tried to fire him. They called Joel Silver, and he came to set. They were trying to fire Dennis Miller. It didn't work. Well... I can understand with what they put up with, but at least it kind of worked. Anyway, why don't we get into some superlatives? What do you say, you guys? Let's can do we? it. All right. MVP. We know a lot went wrong for people making this movie, but we like it. DJ, who's your MVP? What's making it work for you? I think you know who this is. It's going to be Angie Everhart as Lila. She's my girl. She's stunning. Chad, how about you? Who's your MVP? I'm glad you brought him up earlier because I'm going Todd Masters, who did all the special effects without him. It's still that over-the-top ridiculousness, but it lends to this movie and it makes it better to just get the campiness of the scenes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am a huge fan of Angie Everhart, so I'm glad you picked her. But Dennis Miller, to me, is very enjoyable. I think he does... I, I like watching his character go around. To me, that he hits the tone of what this movie needed to be. I know he's phoning it in, but to me, that's only a sign of you have a very talented person. I, I probably, if you could do it all again, I would put somebody else in their place who doesn't make everybody's life miserable and will work hard and be on the set. So he's still probably the MVP because he's still really good. But I'm not going to lie. I think DJ also kind of nailed like, the, I think Angie herself, not in monster form, but just Angie is the icon in the movie. You could be walking through a rental store and just be like, Psh! I think she's one of the most beautiful women to be in the entertainment industry of all time. So, yeah, I'm with you. Those are two good reasons. I think I like Dennis Miller. I like Angie Everhart. So tipping my hand for people who won't be recasted. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Best supporting actor, DJ. This is kind of a deeper cut, but Aubrey Morris is McCutcheon, like the kind of the the funeral home director slash keeper. I think he is phenomenal. Like he's so funny. And his kind of hot and cold nature and the kind of creep show he puts on. I love it. It's a great choice. He is so eccentric. Yes, yes. There's a creepy scene that I'm pretty sure got cut on TV where he's enjoying his job of dissecting a dead body too much. And it's really gross, but he lets it be funny. Yeah. 
I, I like that choice. Chad, how about you? Best supporting. This is where I've got to give it to Angie Everhart. I, she's the one person who's really trying, and it's, it's not her fault, but this is just slightly above where she's capable of. But I think this movie, it's enhanced by her presence. That's a great choice. My best supporting is Chris Sarandon. I think we haven't really talked about him as much, but I think that he is... He is fantastic. He's really good as this televangelist. He's super slimy. He nails like the deceitfulness and the the hypocrisy of it. You know, he has the remorse to come in. He's blasting up the place with the super soakers and holy water. We didn't really talk about it, but in a movie where everybody felt like everything went wrong, I felt like he went really right. And he was one that they actually got to cast. So, but you caught the Back to the Future illusion, right? When he's doing the hop across the stage with the guitar. Okay. Oh. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of uh, Johnny Be Good. Yeah. All right. Hidden gem. TJ. I should have probably chosen Aubrey Morris for this, but I'm going to choose Whoopi Goldberg because she's such a delightful, unexpected surprise when you're watching this and you're like, what? So Whoopi Goldberg. It's a great choice. That's such a random cameo in a movie that doesn't have, you'd think there'd be more of them when you do that. Yeah. That's a really fun cameo. Chad, how about you? It's the 90s. Whoopi Goldberg can appear in anything. She just shows up. But for me, it's William Sadler. He is the man who played the mummy. And he is the foil to the Crypt Keeper. I love his banter and his games and the puns in the end. Should have really quit while you're ahead. (laughs) And just all those scenes. I always left every Tales from the Crypt episode wanting more Crypt Keeper. I was the opposite of Russell. I wanted more of these scenes. Nice, nice. Now, my hidden gem was Todd Masters. You kind of used it with your MVP, Chad. The special effects artist there is just it really helps bring this thing together recast if you had to recast one person and put somebody else in their place dj who would it be i'm getting rid of dennis miller and i might well not i might i would throw robin williams in there randomly oh that's great well he's ever, he's awesome in everything so yeah i want that movie for sure too um, yeah chad how about you who's your recast I am getting rid of Mr. Miller as well uh, for a multitude of reasons, but I am recasting him with a Tales from the Crypt alum of Treat Williams, and he is in Dead Heat. He leans into this cheesy, absolute ridiculous, campy role really well, so I think he is our private detective here. I want. I'm okay with that. That would be good. Also, although I maintain we might not have heard of this movie if that's the case. So it's fair. I also recasted Dennis Miller. <laughs> Your MVP. I've never done this before, but I mean, it's just too hard to ignore the dysfunction he caused in the set. And it's very likely that even though he's very funny, somebody else just wouldn't have had this, uh, I guess, this, this conflict. So maybe it would have unlocked another level of, of good from that. This was a tough one. I kind of went back and forth on who to put in there. I went with David Spade. Interesting. Because he's sarcastic. I think he's witty. I think he's going to get like one-liners and stuff like that. I don't know if he's too necessarily unimposing from his physical stature necessarily. That's he's my only... He's much more interested in Lilith than Dennis Miller was. Dennis Miller is just very dismissive. I can't see David Spade telling Angie Everhart. I'm not interested. I know. <laughs> but he might be able to do the whole, like, I'm not, I'm telling him I'm not interested, but visibly I am, like, which right. is like, which is a very funny thing too. So yeah, I, I'm not sure I have that perfectly nailed, but I, I like the fact that we all went after Dennis Miller. I think just how he behaved behind the sets, bigger issue than the final product. Best shot. You said you had a hard time doing it. You don't think of this as being a cinematography movie, DJ, but we're going to make you do it anyway. What's your image of the movie? I definitely think Lilith, when she is um, born, reborn again, Mm -hmm. you kind of get the heart, pieces of the heart coming together. Um, And that whole kind of montage there. I'm going to conflate best shot and best scene because, again, I don't think there are any good shots in this film. Like, I I remember scenes of it, but but there's not anything I'd say like, this is artistically done. I would refer to this when referring to other things or referencing other things. I can't do that. It does feel like it was framed by somebody who does TV. 
and I don't mean that to be in a total condescending way, but you're right. Like, there's no sweeping shots. It does hurt that your main actor's not showing up and shooting anything with anybody, but there's no, there's no pivoting, angling, zooming, you know. Continuous shots. They don't really pick great angles either no. necessarily most of the time. So, Chad, how about you? What, what's your best shot? DJ has nailed it from the beginning. There is none. There is no best shot. And I, I've never done that. If you're forcing me, it's... I am. It's just the puppet of the Crypt Keeper as he's holding his hand up and he's missing his hand, but he's holding the arm. I think it's more the building for me, the expo building from 89 for Vancouver. But when Chris Sarandon's in the church and like, you know, he's getting ready to blast Satan coming up and stuff like that, or the guitar scene when he's doing that, there's these shots that are taken in this church setting. Again, it's not actually a church, but that they've made up to be a church. That is probably the best i mean probably some of its music that's doing it too so these are the most inspired moments of capturing the visual i think by the way this is lilith (laughs) that's perfect dj's cat lilith came to say hello with a cameo as well i also like the over the like the laser shot like when dennis miller's handcuffed at the end and they have to like shoot her from across the room the slow motion that they use this to detonate it's terrible but the the over the shoulder kind of angle it's all the same space, though. It's the building they're in that's doing all the work here. That's an architect's choice if, you, if there ever was one. Absolutely. Best scene. I think we might have tipped your hand there a little bit, DJ. What's your best scene? No, actually, it's going to be the ballroom blitz scene where yeah. all the vampires are getting kind of shot up with holy water. It's, it's mine, too. Yep. Chad? It's mine clean sweep. Well. This movie has absolutely zero legs without that scene. I'll be honest with you. I wanted even more of this scene. I think I told Chad more squirt guns, more scenes. Just I, I, I don't know how many minutes of content I can add to it, but yes, this is. I love the final shoot up in like Hot Fuzz because it's funny, incredibly violent, and very fun with the music as well. This is going down that path, so I can only say tread deeper. Yep, some water balloon grenades. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Nice touch, Chad. Yeah. Best wardrobe or makeup moment, because this this is a tough one. There's a lot of fun supernatural makeup in here as well. DJ. Best wardrobe makeup moment. I really loved Lilith's kind of sci-fi makeup in the birthing scene. Like, I feel like she looks a lot better there than at the end when she's like the kind of uh, witchy kind of hobgoblin looking thing. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more scary. And she's wearing this kind of like period piece kind of like dress. We never see the full dress of we just see the collar. And it's kind of like this kind of cowl collar around her. Love it. Want more of it. Okay. From the undead. Chad, are you going with an undead one too? I'm not. I can't get past every bit of Lilith's wardrobe whenever she is just walking around is stunning it helps when you've got one of the most beautiful women in history with angie but the silver dress she doesn't wear it as long as the purple dress but she wears the silver dress for a scene in the mortuary and the contrast with the red hair it's it's gorgeous and i think part of the wardrobe and makeup is i'm just crediting a supermodel for being beautiful I can't help it. I'm doing the same thing. So I went green dress. So, yeah. I mean, it's uh, p- pick your flavor. So, was that when they're in the strip club? The, the green dress with little straps or which? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's when she's tempting Dennis Miller. Yeah. She's got like his wallet, you know, and stuff like that. Yes. Okay. There were moments of this that felt like it was a little bit B movie ish or like, like that felt too convenient. The wallet drop was like a like i know you need to get to somewhere from here but that that was one of those moments that felt a little cut and the other one that really kind of got to me i might bring up here in just a second change one thing dj this isn't directly related to the movie but dennis miller went on jay leno's show either right before or just as the movie was being released and completely trashed it was like don't watch it it's just tits and vampires and all sort of stuff I wish he wouldn't have done that. I feel like it would have gotten a better reception. And I mean, maybe because he did that, it got the cult following. But I want to know. I want to know what it could have been like. Which is ironic, because if you did that today and you said, hey, breasts and vampires, that's going to do gangbusters. Yeah, that's not super soakers. Yes. That's a great choice. Chad, change one thing. 
There's so many things, but I think for me, I just, if we're going to cast Dennis Miller here and we're going to hamstring him on budget, give them two and a half million dollars more in budget. Increase the budget so they have the time to make the movie that they want. They have time to do the reshoots and we just get a more coherent product in the end. So give them a little bit more budget. Hmm. That's a good one. I think with that more budget that you're giving them, Mike, know what I would, immediately where I would go. The scene where they save Eric Alaniak's character, the moment that they save Catherine from the vampire after the super soaker shoot ups and stuff like that, they're suddenly in the church. Like, yes. like, like, like Chris Sarandon's like last dying words, like, tell the world. I'm like, well, that's a pretty hard sell on your televangelist TV network. Nothing about your plan makes sense. Even if it's the last wish of a dying man, it doesn't make sense. So I want to be chased out of the bordello for running for their lives to get Catherine out of there. I want a car chase scene. Maybe you didn't kill Corey Feldman off quite early enough, and he's the lead henchman coming after them. And I want more holy water being thrown and more shooting and cars breaking down flat tires. And I want the car to crash near the church because maybe she thinks that that's a safe holy place like vampires hate crosses and stuff like that let's go to church and van and like i could even see that being a funny dialogue between her and dennis miller in the car and be like dennis miller's like jewish like i don't want to go to church you know and she's driving or something like that like i think this could be a fun scene to add it would be another action intensive scene and then there would be a reason to finish in the glass church so i almost felt like something completely got removed and cut from the movie here and I think there's an opportunity to do something really funny and meaningful there. So, again, I never noticed this the first time. I was too mesmerized by the vampires and the ladies. But, um, but upon further investigation, I thought, like, huh, there's something we really could do here. I can see Corey Feldman, like, headbanging, doing that manic, slobbering tongue action behind a wheel of a car, chasing him, like, ha, ah, ah. Like, yeah. He just does such a great job as a vampire. I enjoyed him a whole lot more in that form. Yeah, and a bad boy vampire at that. Yes. So, best quote. A lot of good stuff here. Dennis Miller does a lot of good work here. DJ, do you have a best quote? Donate your heart out, baby. That's my job. (laughs) Chad, do you have another one-liner? I can't say the majority of these due to our family-friendly podcast. So, I think I'm going to go with a Dennis Miller line of six-pack in the side cleavage. Nice. This pool scene. He was relentlessly brutal on, the, on that guy in the billiard hall. Yes, he's just really prodding him and getting his goat. I didn't actually write the whole thing down, so I'm going to have to cut this and go with something else. But does anybody have the quote from the, like the really weird biker dude, like who like says like you know they'll do things you've never heard of? Like oh, I mean, like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't Cunningham find... wake. Yeah, like I. It's really, I probably just have to cut all this because I can't find the exact quote because it's delivered beautifully by the guy who's like, you'll never, you might walk again in three days. And like, so that was amazing. So I will say I loved the line where they said, this feels like a bad Tales of the Crypt episode. Yes. I don't know if there's such thing as breaking the fourth wall to the fifth wall to the TV show series, something that you're not even in. I loved it. So I I wish there had been more really tongue in cheek moments like that. I don't mind if Dennis Miller talks to the camera in a little bit. They don't do that, but I would be okay with that. All right. We have come full circle and on a five star scale, half star intervals. DJ, what would you give this movie? Put it at a three. I mean, it's again, the cinematography isn't there. I'm not going to it for the kind of artistic direction as far as films go. I'm going to it because I love Tales of the Crypt. All right. Chad, how about you? You always cringe when I do this, but I'm going to say it's two and a half, but it is fun. That is not a slight on this movie. It is a fun time. You know what you're getting into. It's not a cinematographic. It's not a masterpiece. It is what it is. And it's Tales from the Crypt with just campiness, gore, and beautiful women. If that's what you go in, one thing, uh, perfect. Get your popcorn. You're going to have a great time. I was, I initially kind of thought where DJ was, this is a very fun three-star movie, but I've had so much fun reading about this, learning about this, watching all the disaster articles that are behind there, seeing the podcast that ALCast does that just 
this is such an interesting thing of, as they say, how not to make a movie. And the dialogue that comes from being able to hop in and study it, I cannot help but say I've gotten another half a star of enjoyment out of like, I wish there was this level of information about every movie we covered. And it's fun to hear when things don't go well or the creators are unhappy with how things are going. I've had days with my work where you're sitting there going like, there's this other person who's got this other idea for this. I'm really frustrated and like, it makes me feel a lot better knowing that somebody in Hollywood has had a much worse day than me <laughs> or much several months than I did. So I had so much fun studying this one. It's 3.5 just because of, like you said, Chad, it's a lot of fun. It is very sexy and it is, uh, it's an interesting movie to learn about. Absolutely. Yeah, we all n landed on the word fun. So it doesn't really matter where the rating is. If you check out this movie, you're going to have fun. I think the rewatchability is actually pretty high too. Just being tied to the there's a time of year for these sorts of things. So there's always a time. It no no don't it doesn't have to be October. You can, you can be mid May and feeling a little frisky, and you're gonna put on Bordello of Blood. That's fine. That's fine. Well, we had a devil of a time making this movie, Chad. And they're gonna select the movie next time. All of these movies have the word devil in the title for each of these movies. Are you ready? I'm ready. Option one, The Devil's Rejects from 2005. The murderous backwoods Firefly family take to the road to escape the vengeful Sheriff Wydell, who is not afraid of being as ruthless as his target. Option two, The Devil Doll from 1936. An escaped convict uses miniaturized humans to wreak vengeance on those who framed him. Option three, House of the Devil from 2009. In 1983, Financially struggling college student Samantha Hughes takes a strange babysitting job that coincides with a full lunar eclipse. She slowly realizes her clients harbor a terrifying secret, putting her life in mortal danger. Oh, man. I know no one on our podcast other than me has seen House of the Devil from 2009. It is fantastic. Ty West, we are doing that one. All right. This sounds like your curating of show here, Chad. This sounds like this has your fingerprints all over it. It it just might. All right. DJ, thank you so much for coming in. We always love having you on the show. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being back as always. And hit me up anytime. I love this. And thank you all the lords, ladies and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. So we want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Give us a like on Facebook. Instagram, follow us on Twitter at at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable on yahoo.com. And producing and providing this podcast is fun, but not free. So we invite you to support the show at our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash retromovieroundtable. All contributions are much appreciated and will go towards making the show better for you, the listeners. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Chad? What have you done to him? What have you done to his eyes, you maniacs? He has his father's eyes.